Dear everyone, welcome to our second online event here at the Nordic Edge Expo Smart City Conference here in Stavanger, Norway. And for the next two hours, I hope you will join us. This is NoHo EdTech 2021. Yesterday, we saw several examples of how unique features of digital technology may be used, both to adapt teaching to individual needs and contribute to solving global challenges with sustainability by making education accessible for all. Today, we'll look at how we must arrange teaching and when the web and educational uh, technology is a central part of the learning environment. And the term to memorize today, listen, it's learning experience design. You'll hear more about that soon. We'll also follow, what the money, follow the money to learn what venture capital thinks will be inside the EdTech and virtual learning environment of the future. And this is the sixth know-how uh, co uh, EdTech conference run by the University of Stavanger. And as you see, the venue is quite special. We're on an electric ferry, totally electric, on the harbor of Stavanger. The ferry is called Riger Elektra, and we are right on the fjords. And no rain for the time being, good for, good for us. Uh, I'm Ingve Tveranger, and uh, will be your co host for the next two hours. With me here is Andrew Rhodes, my expert co-host. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Nice to hear, because we're going to go on for two hours, Andrew, and just have to introduce you properly. You are an experienced teacher and our strategic advisor on the school initiative at the technology provider Atea. And you have more than 25 years of experience working with teachers with technology as a tool to improve and transform learning. And if you look back on yesterday, what would you say are the main takeaways? I think we had some great speakers and presentations yesterday and we saw a lot of the possibilities that exist for using technology in the classroom. But I think we also saw some of the challenges that uh, teachers and educators face when they're trying to bring technology into their classroom. And today, what can we expect? Well, again, I think we've got a great range of speakers, a really interesting range of topics, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about how we can design learning in the digital age. Cool. Um, if you're watching this, uh, you'll know that this uh, webcast is for free, and uh, if you uh, want to uh, share it with someone, it's on the Nordic Edge Expo platform. And uh, uh, below us here on the screen, there should be a form for you where you can submit your questions and comments and we'll pick them up as we go. Our partners that make it possible, to, possible for us to organize the know-how EdTech are, as usual, the University of Stavanger, Rogaland County Council, the City of Stavanger, the Municipality of Time and the tech provider, Atea. And we'll dive straight in. First today, we'll get a story on the learning experience. It's coming from a university student during the lockdown. Tom Daniel Lögrud is a student at the Norwegian School of Sports Science. He has voiced his opinion on the current standard of digital education through several articles in the Krono, independent uh, newspaper for higher education and research in Norway. Here is Tom Daniel with his view on quality digital education for the 21st century student, how he would like to see it. So what is a 21st century student? Is this a student who is fully digital or analog or a bit of both? This is one of the questions I asked myself when I was going to go back to my studies and do a new degree at Norwegian School of Sports Science. Because over the last few years, there's been a huge change in our society, but also in how the universities work, how students are. We've gone from having full lecture theatres like these to having empty lecture theatres. We've gone from talking with fellow students about our thesis and assignments to spending most of our time washing our hands. I've gone from working in marketing and PR, for example, a few years ago with the Norwegian Armed Forces, to spending most of my time in front of a laptop and reading books. So as I started my new life as a student again at the uh, Norwegian School of uh, Sports Science, I asked myself, what are other students like in Norway? Are students like me? who feel the need for a more flexible education, a more 
adapted education they could use and learn at their own pace. So when I started looking into this, I had a few theories, but I wanted to see if there are more students like me. So for example, looking at the latest figures from Eurostudent, you can see that 52% of Norwegian students are 25 years or older. And if you compare that to, for example, on the other side of the European scale, with France only having 14% in the same group. So this clearly shows that they are, the students are getting more and more mature that are getting older, meaning they're more established. For example, 60% of all Norwegian students work during the lecture period. Uh, if you compare that again, for example, to France, it's 32%. So a lot of students are working either to cover living expenses or because they feel the need to get work experience that will be relevant for their degree. Another thing is that 23% of Norwegian students have kids. That's a huge difference compared to our European neighbours. So all this means that there are students like me who might have kids or who might be older or might have an established career already or might see the need to work to cover li living expenses like a mortgage or even cover tuition fees. So this made me realise that a lot more students like me are out there and that the institutions need to take this into account when it comes to making more flexible learning experiences, be it online or in person on campus. So when I started my studies again at the Norwegian School of Sports Science, I did have some expectations. I was coming from a media background where you had a user-centered focus, where you'd to do user testing, you'd make sure that the topic you were talking about was adapted to the channel you were gonna publish it in. So, and also I thought to myself, well, the pandemic's been going on now for six months, so surely they must have sorted out most of the kinks. And also, I was hoping that the industry itself, be it the institution I'm in or the other institutions, would have had a much more digitization prior to the pandemic as well. So I'm going to share a bit about my experiences at uh, my institution and also what I believe are both good cases and also the issues that face us when dealing with the future of education. So in one of my subjects called human physiology, which is quite a theoretical and theoretical and heavy subject to learn, there's a lot of details. And instead of doing a two hour lecture on Zoom, our professor decided to make bite-sized pre-recorded videos in the range of from 10 to 20 minutes where you could learn at your own pace. And I think this clearly reflect how we consume videos nowadays. We consume videos on social media, on YouTube and other streaming platforms that are a lot shorter compared to if you go back 10, 15 years. And also this made, it made more apparent to me when I was faced with other subjects on the same institution who did not do the same as him, who had the two hour lectures on Zoom, it became hard to follow, it became hard to get a good learning outcome from it. And that became even more apparent to me uh, when I was given an alternative. The same teacher again, he relied quite a lot on dedicated discussion forums on a different topics. So this would allow a quick response between student and teacher, but also between students. So you can have a two-way communication instead of it being just one way from the teacher to the student. And this helped a lot as well to give a better learning outcome. In another subject, the teacher posted more or less the entire curriculum at the beginning of term where they had a modular system where you'd work your way down through the different modules which each contain quizzes, key questions you would answer and videos of pre-recorded lectures. So you could do it in your own pace and they also, in addition to this, had live lectures to complement this curriculum but this allowed us to actually have the flexibility we needed. Again, these were only the two subjects that I found that were the good cases of my institutions um, that actually seemed to work, at least for me as a student. 
But if I look outside my institution as well, you see sites like, for example, enkelexamen.no, which means simpleexam.no, where it started as a need from business school students back in 2012, where they saw that their learning needs weren't being met by their institution. So they decided to take the curriculum and make it into bite-sized videos and explain it in a different manner with interactive quizzes. This site is now booming, clearly showing there is a market for this out there. Another example like this would be mededeasy.no, which is aimed at students like me studying health and fitness, or but more also people who are doing medicine like doctors and nurses. It, they have a system where they give a great overview of all the lessons like you see here on the left hand side with the chapters. You can easily access whatever subtopic you're interested in. And I believe that universities can do the same and clearly with services like these popping up, th there's a market for it. But in order to get to this, in order to get to what I believe would be the future of education, I do see some issues, issues I faced at my institution, but also that I believe other students are facing as well. I believe that it's a problem with management because management at schools need to make it a priority. It needs to be made a priority by the headmaster, by the board of directors, and they need to make sure that this is put on the agenda. It can't be something that the IT department work on on the side or a e-learning division work on. It needs to be made a priority. And at the same time, I feel that a lot of times teachers are left up to their own accord. It, they're not offered enough training from the school they work at, meaning that it's only the teachers who either have the technical expertise already or have the time to make a more flexible and adaptive learning experience. So I, lead, I believe that that's something the institutions need to actually make available for the staff, practical training, not just a PDF manual. And also, I believe that the issue is that you're not adapting the curriculum enough for online consumption. Yes, uh, doing a recording in Zoom with a two-hour lecture or a, a recording of a campus is a solution, but you need to adapt the curriculum for consuming it online. And also, I believe another issue is the fact that it's not compulsory for all lectures, for example, at least to record uh, the lectures or adapt their curriculum so that when they actually some teachers do it, like one of my teachers did, you end up having a huge quality difference within the institution itself. But also on a larger scale, I believe there's an issue with it not being a national standard, a national requirement of making it compulsory when the teachers have received training to actually do a recording as well. So if I look to the future and see if you resolve all these issues, what would an ideal future from my point of view be for a student? I believe they shouldn't all be digital. It should be on-campus presence. I want to be on campus. I love being on campus, talking with my fellow students and teachers. But I believe these systems can coexist. I believe this will allow you to make a more inclusive education system, meaning that the single dad on the outskirts of a major city can still do his engineering degree at University of Stavanger whilst raising his children. Or, for example, the pro athlete at Norwegian School of Sports Science can carry on doing her sport whilst getting a degree at the same time. So I believe the future will be three types of education. One would be the practical training where you would need to be on campus, be it for lab exercises or learning how to use an equipment. The second will be a traditional lecture that can either be watched on campus or will be recorded from start to finish. Or the third is making fully flexible and adapted learning resources that can be made available online. All this, I believe, can be reused and can be used to innovate more and more so that you adapt the different curriculum to the students' needs. And this can then give the best learning experience and actually allow everyone uh, access to a good quality education. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom Daniel. This Thank was you. so interesting, and um, I'm getting more and more curious. Without giving away anyone, uh, what would you say is the worst case that you've come across well, uh, from your own experience and talking to fellow students? I believe that would be when I'm faced with lecturers who refuse to actually record as a minimum. 
the lectures so that students are faced with, especially now during a pandemic, if you look, set aside all the different uh, needs I said earlier, if you just look at a pandemic itself, students are faced with the choice of having to stay at home with COVID-related symptoms or and not and miss out on the lectures or take the chances and go to university because you have teachers that refuse to record. Oh, that's pretty rough. Yes, <laughs> it is. So uh, you have kind of uh, voiced what you want from the future. Yes. And uh, I'm assuming that you get some response from the establishment. What What have you heard? Um, what I've been told, because I've been asking for the administration at my institution to make it compulsory to at least record. And uh, they said that this should be an, uh, a choice, a personal choice for each teacher. And that they, but they have a strong recommendation about recording, but that is it. And then they will not change their mind even though there are students who are considering dropping out of the course because they're not feeling that they can actually carry on either with their career or studies or sports uh, altogether. But you're kind of voicing that uh, students are becoming a customer. So you yeah. can kind of demand uh, some kind of product from your university or school. I believe... Is that fair? Yes. Because I know, yes, in Norway we do have free education, but at the same time they need to take into account that they are a business, they need to attract students. The, stu the universities are competing with each other. So if they don't get attract students by offering them flexible solutions, they end up losing funding. If they don't have funding, they can't do the precious, precious research that they want to do. So meaning that teachers need to realize this, that actually it is a business in one way. Wow, comments? You've, well, it's interesting. You've given examples of uh, these websites that create you know, really engaging short pieces of video and animations. Are you proposing that all lecturers should become experts in creating things like animations, engaging videos? Um, no, because I believe their job is to teach, but at the same time they need the support staff, they need uh, people who can be it animators who can create uh, animations or videographers who can uh, create videos for them. So that is not the job of the teacher. But that me again, that's back to what I said earlier about management. They need to actually make it priority and actually have the resources available and use their staff, for example, be it uh, communication staff or hire someone specifically to work with this and create videos that can actually be consumed in a different way. Because it, it is boring to watch a lecture that is just literally copied from the lecture theatre onto a digital platform without actually making it more interactive. So do you think your lecturers are thinking enough about the learning experience, bearing in mind that we've got someone coming to talk about learning experience design a little bit later? Um, some of them. Not all. Uh, I believe some are conscious of the fact that they want to get feedback from students throughout the term, not just at the end of it, uh, but also that they um, actually try to adapt it. But I mean, that maybe they should do some more user testing, like you would never launch an, a website or an app with actually testing it on the end user. And the end user here is the students. So what you're saying is that uh, the, the universities and teaching institutions should talk more to you guys, who are the students, on how to develop their digital education? Yes. Like have a reference group or...? Yeah, you can do, uh, yeah, you can do a reference group. You can do, uh, when you're launching, either a new type of uh, learning resource online, for example, try and test it on a group of students be it both from in the current year that might consume it, but also students who've taken the course previously, so that you can actually have someone who's done the, the old version and can see, okay, is the new version a better experience? Uh, we're soon going to hear about what, uh, what Andrew said about designing a learning experience, and we're, we'll have you with us, but fi one final que question in this yeah. session is, um, I'm thinking about the professors. Yeah. You know, what you're kind of uh, projecting here is a big, big challenge for them. So uh, it's kind of overwhelming for many uh, professors and lecturers, don't you think? Um, yes, I understand it can be, because I know um, it might seem harsh in some ways, but at the same time, then they need to make sure that they push upwards towards the headmaster and the board of directors, for example. Uh, so it's not just the students voicing their opinions or the IT department or, uh, or e-learning department. It needs to be push from a push from them as well because then if they voice the opinion then you can uh, make a lot of noise and make a lot of change 
in your opinion, is that the way to go forward? Well, I think as we heard yesterday, like change is something that's happening continually in education. So I think as educators, we have to accept, you know, change is inevitable. Great. And um, uh, Tom Daniel has described his vision of how technology can play a role in facilitating education for the needs of the 21st century student. In the next session, we'll look at two specific cases. We'll see how this vision becomes practice and what most strongly may influence the development of online learning and the future edtech. The first case will be on the story of uh, how a new profession of learning experience design rapidly is evolving. After that, we uh, will look at what may be the strongest driver for development, the venture capital. Only the first six months of this year, a billion dollars has been invested in edtech in Europe alone. And is it reasonable to expect that we soon will notice the effect of this in the education sector? But the first case that we're going to look at is designing a learning experience. A common argument for not going online or excuse for bad quality of online teaching is lack of digital skills. And we started yesterday with the claim of Nicholas Negroponte from MIT that the digital revolution is over. More than 20 years ago, at a time where e-learning indeed also was a common term and digital educational technology had been in common use already for a decade. In our time, lack of digital skills can rather appear as a substitute argument for not tackling the real challenge. The lack of knowledge or even will to realize how educational activities should be organized and what resources are needed to provide a useful offer to the st a student of the 21st century, as pointed out by Tom Daniel a few minutes ago. Through the influence of design thinking, UX, user experience methods, systems designs, advances in the learning sciences and the emerge of learning analytics, new approaches and professions have though appeared learning experience design and learning engineering. These roles will be high impact agents of change at their institutions, promoting student-centered and inclusive mindsets in their collaboration with faculty and students. If you Google the term learning experience design, you will quickly come across Nils Floor. He is the originator of the term and the vision behind it. Nils, himself a designer, is the owner of the company Shapers and teaches learning experience design at several Dutch universities. Now Nils is here with us in a studio from Utrecht in the Netherlands to talk to us on designing for a learning experience. Go Nils! <laughs> Thank you so much. So a couple of years I came to Norway for the first time with my family and we went on a vacation, we drove around the country and after about three weeks we ended up in Oslo, in the Kontiki Museum. Now probably most of you know this, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. The Kontiki Museum is about the extraordinary life and stories of famous um, uh, uh, scientists and explorer Thor Heyerdahl, and sorry for butchering that name. Um, <laughs> and his story is really interesting because he had a point to prove as a scientist. He believed that a long time ago, people from South America would have been able to travel all the way to what's now known as Polynesia using only wooden rafts. And to prove his point, because no one believed him in the scientific uh, world, he set out to do the same thing. He built a raft called Kontiki. He uh, floated across the Pacific Ocean and ended up in Polynesia. Now that's a powerful experience, that's something that's really memorable. And that's a, something we can learn a lot from as learning experience designers. And in fact it's such a powerful experience that just learning about this experience by hearing about it and seeing stuff about it is in itself a wonderful educational learning experience. So that's what my work is about as a learning experience designer. I try to offer people f meaningful, valuable learning experiences. And that brings me to a first question. So what makes an experience memorable? Now, to answer this question, I would like you to think about some of the experiences you've had over the past year. 
So as you're kind of contemplating the last year, some experience, some memories will pop up into your mind. And chances are that these experiences have a strong emotional component in them. You, are, you have an emotional tie with these memories. And that's not a coincidence. Because uh, our, our emotions, they influence how we experience. They kind of uh, influence our experiences, but also how we store and retrieve those experiences from our memory. So they are a vital part of what we uh, kind of call our experiences. Now, what happens if you take out the emotions from an experience? Well, let me give you an example. Let's say you are driving home uh, last night and something happened on your way home and you're sharing that with your family. So you could say, um, I was driving home at a constant speed of about 90 kilometers an hour when a vehicle entered my lane, which left me very little space, so I had to employ my brake pedal in order to prevent a collision. After that, I continued my travels and now I'm home. That sounds a bit weird, right? Probably you would have said something like, listen guys, I just have to tell you what happened on my way home. So I was driving home, I was feeling tired, I was looking forward to being with you tonight, you know, spending the evening together, when out of nowhere this maniac comes into my lane and uh, you know, I, had to, uh, I, I was scared, to I, was th I thought I was going to die, so I pushed my brake pedal as hard as I could and I nearly crashed into him, but I just prevented from that. After that, you know, when I settled down, I got so angry because, I, you know, why would someone do this, like, drive like this, put me in this danger? And now, when I, now that I'm home, I'm just really relieved to be here with you and I'm, I'm happy to be safe and sound at home with you. So those are two renditions of the same experience. One is factual and not very personal, and the other one is how people talk about their experience with a lot of emotion. It's, it's about feeling tired, looking forward to something, um, being scared, being uh, angry, being relieved. So um, it's, it's, it's you know, n natural to include emotions in our experiences. But when you look at the experiences, let's say our educational experience, often emotion doesn't play a big part in it. And what tends to happen is that educators uh, kind of pick uh, life apart into a s a smaller uh, controllable elements that can be structured in a way that fits an educational system, which makes sense, you know, you have to make sure it fits. You know, for example, you teach separate topics while those topics in real life are, are kind of intertwined. So there can be a kind of a disconnect between our let's say, our human experiences, our real-life experiences, and our educational experiences, where our educational experiences are re really highly structured, while life is far less structured. And, you know, one is more uh, predictable, for good reason, you want to end up uh, at the same place at the same time with everyone. And life can be very unpredictable. And in a way, you know, our human experiences are very personal and emotional and our educational experiences can be much more impersonal and less, you know, I emotional. So I'm not saying that educational experiences are bad necessarily, or that life experiences are good, but you want to balance the two. So in my work I try to kind of find a balance between predictability and unpredictability, and uh, personal and, 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 and maybe more uh, generic or s systematic. So that's, that's something that would be interesting to look at. Now, I'm talking about experience, but f let's take a moment to define what is a learning experience. And f let's break it down <laughs> to learning and experience first. So the word experience. Now, many people think that an experience is something extraordinary, something uh, like uh, traveling the world, climbing the Swiss Alps, um, uh, bungee jumping, uh, running through the streets of Pamplona, being chased by wild bulls, now that's an experience. And of course those are experiences, but to be honest, experience can be very dull and boring and ordinary as well. Um, so it's, uh, when I talk about designing learning experiences, uh, experiences can be anything, literally. 
So my definition is an, an experience is any kind of situation you encounter that takes a certain amount of time and leaves some kind of impression. That's basically everything that happens to you from the moment you wake up until the moment you go to sleep. Now, if you have endless possibilities in what an experience can be, and you add to that that I believe that you can learn from any experience, then the possibilities for learning experiences are endless. And that's great, that's an opportunity, because it allows you to open up and to look at new ways of learning, to create experiences that are different, that, are, that have never been done before. But it's also a challenge or a problem, because if there are endless possibilities, what choices do you make? And that's where learning experience design comes in. Um, the choices you make are based on the, the method that you use, the tools that you use, the, the perspective you have, the skills you have. And those help you to kind of focus your creative energy and to, 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 to structure the creative process that enables you to create these different kinds of experiences instead of just being creative and having wild ideas without having a very specific outcome. Um, now, you might wonder, uh, me talking about learning experience and its profession, are you able to design a learning experience? And the answer is yes, and you are already doing it. Um, maybe not exactly the same way I'm doing it, but we're all designing learning experiences, creating them, offering them, as a teacher, of course, but also as a, as a parent or as a friend. You know, um, as, as parents, we take our children hiking or to a museum and we, 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 we answer questions to, for them. We have deep and meaningful conversations with our friends. We uh, help a tourist find his way when he's lost. And those are all experiences we offer to other people. But the thing is, who you are kind of determines what kind of learning experiences you can design. And um, having uh, learning experience design uh, as, as a, a method of working enables you to basically design for any situation you can imagine. You use the same principles for different people, young or old, uh, students or professionals, uh, in business or in school, can be anything. Now that doesn't mean that I'm here to convince you that everyone here should be a learning experience designer. We need a lot of teachers as well. And um, what I see happen when I train uh, teachers, for example, is that instead of a few of them who actually become learning experience designers, most of them, they kind of cherry pick elements of learning experience design that work best for them. And I think that's great because it enables them to kind of enrich what they're doing. And there are some really interesting uh, results that come from that. Um, First of all, if they are able to, to let's say, uh, you know, create better experiences for their students, even just in a small way, you will see higher student engagement, more you know, positive emotions in that sense, and, and often better results. But also, it makes the whole process of creating these experiences of, of, of you know, teaching a more enjoyable process, which is just as important because if you love what you're doing, it shows in your work. So, in the end, if you do it right, you have a happy teacher and happy students, which you, know, you can't ask for more. Um, now, I've talked about learning experience or experiences and the emotions that play a role in them that make them memorable. And I just want to point out that when you design for emotions, when you take those into account, you have to be aware of the fact that it isn't just about making people happy. Um, unfortunately, in education, of course, there are always will be negative emotions like, uh, you know, fear of failure or, uh, you know, being stressed out for a test or uh, other forms of anxiety. And that's kind of a bit inherent to learning, which is, you know, by definition, doing something you're not able to do yet. You're doing something new and that can be hard, challenging, frustrating. So it's it's okay that there are negative emotions, but you want to design experiences that deal with those in a respectful way and that promote positive emotions at the same time. 
So right now, you might wonder, um, OK, so I'm interested in learning experience design. I'm a teacher. Uh, what can I do? Well, here are some steps you can take. First of all, remember that any experience can be a learning experience. So don't limit yourself to the kinds of experiences that you're familiar with. Try to let go of what you know and in order to you know, create you know, new kinds of experiences. Second, be aware of those emotional aspects that I've talked about a lot today. Um, design for positive emotions and also treat negative emotions respectfully. Be careful with that. Um, get a better understanding of the students as uh, you know, I was just, just was talked about by the previous speaker. Talk to the students, get to know them, see what motivates them, what drives them, and use that as inspiration, together with inspiration from your own experiences. Now, if you want to get familiar with the fundamentals of learning experience design, uh, you can easily visit lxd.org or learningexperiencedesign.org. Um, it's a site we created for anyone to get familiar with the basic concept of learning experience design. So use those resources. Um, and finally, if you've done all that, just try it. Give it a shot. See what happens. Experiment. Don't be afraid. You know, embrace your creativity. See what happens. If you fail at something, great, you've learned a lot. If you succeed, you've learned a lot and you've succeeded even better. So I would like to wrap up the way that I began this talk. Um, by quoting Thor Heyerdahl, which kind of sums up my attitude towards how I look at learning experience design. He said, borders, I've never seen one, but I've heard they exist in the minds of some people. Thank you. And thank you, Niels. This was so cool to hear. And uh, we're going to be talking more with you a little bit later, but I have a couple of questions right now, okay. uh, if, you, if you just stay there for a moment. Um, the learning experience design, I'm just curious as to when was the eureka moment where you sort of realized this is the concept? Yeah. When, when did that happen? Well, it was a quite a conscious moment, to be, to be honest. It was in uh, June 2007. I still remember where and when, but I was... I had this very basic idea. I thought we learn from our experiences as a, just as a very general learning concept. It can't be denied. So if you learn from what you experience, and I was already designing experiences, user experiences, and uh, I thought, why not design the experiences you learn from? And then we kind of got talking, and someone said, well, that should be called learning experience design. And I thought, great, let's look it up. And I asked Google. And there were exactly zero hits on learning experience design. Oh, wow. So I thought, I have two things to do. I have to make sure that I start kind of uh, exploring what it might be so I can uh, share it with the world. And I need to register some domain names because there were none of them were taken. <laughs> <laughs> so you got really busy. Yeah, I got busy straight <laughs> away. And that's been my, my, my journey for the past 14 years now, um, really to try and promote and apply and develop learning experience design on a global level. And Andrew, when you hear this, what are you thinking? Well, really fascinating. And I had two questions for you, actually. One was, do you think learning experience design should be part of every teacher training course? I think there should at least be elements of learning experience design in there. Um, I think, as already was discussed in the previous talk, that uh, using things like uh, testing your, 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 what you create, um, getting to know the, the students better, designing with them in mind specifically, it makes a big difference. So I think, you know, um, sometimes maybe teachers kind of forget how creative they are because they have a system to function in. But as soon as they see ways to break out of the system, they can have a lot of fun doing it. So uh, it's an enjoyable process. Cool. And the other question I had was, thinking a bit as a teacher, I've got a class full of students who all learn in different ways. Does this mean I need to design a learning experience for each of the students? Well, you how do I kind of personalize the learning experience? That's a good question. And I think, in a way, for instance, when you take a, a um, primary school teacher who's working with one class of students for the whole year, 
that's really personal attention. So that's already showing that uh, you know the teacher knows the children and they they work for the, uh, they uh, they kind of know what to do with whom. Um, when you're dealing with larger groups of students, um, at least uh, be aware of the fact that there are differences and kind of try to figure out what are kind of like the, the, the main subgroups you might deal with, come up with some alternative strategies or activities, and that will already improve the overall experience. Because as soon as someone notices that, well, this works really well for me, and there's also a different version that works better for someone else, even if it's just a, f a minor tweak in the design, that can already uh, make people feel more uh, heard and more understood. So it pays off. Mm. Thank you, Niels and Andrew. And uh, we'll hear, mo hear more from you in a little bit. Um, we've seen both yesterday and today several examples on how edtech and online technologies by themselves lead to change and new opportunities for collaboration, teaching and learning. Less known is the driving force that indirectly impact the development of edtech probably most, the venture capital. For any good idea or startup in edtech, the venture funding may be the difference of failure or success. And if you don't believe this may be the case, look at the scale. Only the first six months of 2021, a billion dollars is invested in edtech in Europe alone. The largest investments are in China, United States and Britain, which are the markets that are likely to influence us most. And to understand what's coming and what our virtual learning environments will look like in the future, we need to understand where the venture companies put the money. We now go to London to Benoit Vars, who is working with early stage startup companies. Benoit is a partner at Bright Eye Ventures, that is the leading edtech venture capital fund in Europe. Benoit will give us an insight in the rapidly evolving international edtech market. He has also brought with him Alberto Lopez from the Spanish company Geniali, which is a promising scale-up that we'll likely encounter. But first, Benoit, the digital stage is yours. Great, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have a presentation prepared, so hopefully you guys can see that. Um, and I'm just going to try to click through it. Okay, so I've been introduced. I won't. I won't um, belabor the point. I think the first thing to to realize that probably everyone who's is listening has has some uh, experience in this is that just that the uh, rate of adoption of ed tech, um, both inside and outside the classroom, um, really skyrocketed um, in the last year. Um, COVID was a was a big force behind that. Um, but you know, just to give some sense of it. You know, 95% of K-12 teachers in uh, in in the U.S. Uh, you know used online strategies um, versus uh, in, in in the last year versus on the previous year when they were surveyed, maybe 65% were using um, digital online strategies daily in the classroom. So so quite a spike in the U.S. and in, in Europe. Um, you know, 86% of educators use online distance learning in the last year um, versus less than half. Um, pre-pandemic. So, it, um, and this is K-12 that I'm talking about, not university, but but um, obviously that creates a big sea change. And one statistic that stood out to me is that if you look at Germany, for example, less than half of um, K-12 uh, teachers, uh, school teachers in Germany had a school email address actually in 2019. So, so there's been quite a, a, an evolution um, in, in, in even in markets that, that had lagged a bit. Uh, on uh, and digital, um, you know, and despite the difficulties in implementation, you know, enthusiasm, teacher enthusiasm for these technologies is quite strong. Um, and the, the, you know, this is a, a the, the um, graph chart I'm showing here is actually just um, mobile app installations, but you now have four billion um, ed educational um, apps installed globally, and and quite a, a solid pace in terms of continuing installations um, going forward. Um, and and so, oops, uh, uh, and so so. You know, the reason the usage spiked was because of COVID, but, you know, our view is that that's likely to stay quite high because ed tech can make learning better. Uh, you know, this is quite a dense slide, but essentially you can think of um, ed tech impacting education um, across, you know, four axes. Um, one is, you know, ed tech can make uh, education more affordable. Uh, just by virtue of, if nothing else, removing real estate um, from the equation. Um, uh, it can make uh, ed, ed tech more effective. So, so more affordable means basically the cost per hour of learning can come down. More effective means you actually have more learning per hour, um, potentially by reducing the, the you know, by uh, sort of uh, creating the possibility for more one-on-one -on -one, um, engagement, which is a, a proven way of, of um, increasing the pedagogical impact of any uh, uh, sort of educational experience but also in terms of making learning more personalized or interactive in a number of different ways. Um, you can make 
learning, you know, edtech can also make learning more engaging. So not necessarily that there would be more learning per hour, but because um, uh, because of the interactivity or because of the content that you're able to offer, um, potentially students will want to spend more hours learning. And so that's another way of, of making sort of education more impactful. And then finally, you can think about um, education technology as, as actually enabling um, learning to be more relevant. So, um, you know, uh, it, it, although it may be impossible in, in a smaller school or even in a larger school to, to name uh, or, or to, to um, teach more narrow subjects, if you actually use um, online education to bring together um, communities um, um, who are interested in these narrow subjects across different geographies, then actually you can make, um, you can make learning more relevant for, for people. Um, and so, um, and more relevant, just more aligned with their personal and professional goals, both, you know, young students and, and older people as well. Um, so, so I, I, there are some dense slides here, which I won't belabor, but I think what's happened because there's so much activity in the edtech space is actually um, a lot of the, the larger edtech companies are evolving. So it used to be there were, you know, really broadly speaking, two types of education technology companies. There were tech, uh, companies that um, basically had automated content that you could access both in classroom and at home. Um, and there were um, uh, companies that basically enabled live learning um, of some kind online. Um, and what's happened over the last uh, uh, couple of years is actually um, some of the companies that started out as automated content companies are, are now adding live learning. And some of the companies that started out as live learning are adding more automated content to be able to pr provide richer experiences. And the landscape is getting quite dense. And, and so there's, there's just a lot of, of basically optionality um, in, in, in the ways that you can use technology um, to learn. Um, and that's happening both in the B2B space as well. So I won't, and this is again a dense slide I won't hit on, but the, the main lesson is that this evolution, uh, that, that it, the, the increase in usage of education technology has meant that, that the technology itself is evolving more quickly and becoming richer. Um, and, you know, really importantly from the talk about the business side, um, this evolution, while growth has slowed a bit um, over last year, um, actually what hasn't slowed at all is spending. Um, so, so the spending for um, education technology is, is continuing to grow quite, um, quite quickly, um, which is important, obviously, to, um, for the companies that are, that are providing this technology. Um, and, and, um, and, you know, our view is that there is still a long, long way to go in terms of the evolution of, of spend. Um, you know, the city uh, produced a study, I think, earlier this year or late last year that showed that um, whereas half of learning time is being spent online, um, less than 5% of, of dollars is being spent on online learning. And so there's just a huge, literally trillion dollar gap in terms of the way that people are spending their time learning versus the way that um, people are spending their money. And so there's just, there's a long, long way to go in, in terms of um, driving revenue closer to where um, learning time is being spent. Um, and and what that's meant is that companies that are sort of plugging, uh, filling that gap are, are more and more valuable, right? So um, when I started in this business in 2010, um, you know, I think 500 million uh, had been invested worldwide. Um, uh, you know, on uh, in, in or sorry, yeah, 500 million had been invested worldwide. This year, we're on track for for well north of of uh, 20 to 30 billion. Um, and there are increasing number of what's uh, called in the startup universe unicorn. So um, privately held companies that are worth more than a billion dollars. Um, in uh, when we started the year, I think there were there were, uh, uh, 20 or so. Um, in the last year, there have been 11 more companies have joined the ranks. Uh, or sorry, 13 more companies have joined the ranks in 2021. It changes <laughs> every week practically. Um, and um, and you know um, there are some companies. Uh, it, 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 whereas the, the con there was a concentration, and there's still pretty much a concentration in the U.S. and China. It was a, an exclusively um, U.S. and China club um, before this year, and now you actually have um, many more in India, in uh, in Austria, and Australia, and Israel. So um, we expect that diversity of of sort of um, unicorns to, to continue in terms of geographic diversity, oh, uh, and. Um, and, you know, what you're also seeing, which is important for investors like me and also for the entrepreneurs who are building these companies, is um, increasing paths to liquidity. So it used to be there were kind of a small number of um, uh, companies that would actually buy ed tech, um, ed education technology companies and provide liquidity for investors and um, and, uh, and and entrepreneurs. Um, what's happened is you actually now have a really diverse um, way for entrepreneurs and investors to, to achieve liquidity. So um, increasingly you're seeing um, public offerings, both um, traditional public offerings and SPACs, which are um, kind of special purpose um, uh, IPOs, which can go a bit faster. Um, you have private equity companies, which are increasingly interested in acquiring 
um, uh, education technology companies. Um, we have a growing number of strategic acquirers. So whereas before it was just primarily um, educational publishers, so like Pearson in the UK um, uh, or uh, Macmillan in, in, uh, in, in the US, uh, now you actually have, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of technology acquirers like Prosys um, or, um, you know, uh, human capital uh, uh, sort of uh, companies like, like Workday, which are, um, which are, you know, uh, natural acquirers of these companies. And then the ed tech companies themselves are now becoming large enough um, uh, to acquire other ed tech companies. So companies like Baiju's, which is the most valuable privately held um, ed tech company in the world um, it, it, out of India um, has recently acquired a, a number of companies, including um, Epic listed here, um, Kahoot, which is uh, obviously a Norwegian company, um, you know, and listed publicly, uh, I think, in 2019, has used some of their um, uh, stock and cash to actually acquire um, other ed tech companies. And so, and part of the evolution that I was talking about before, where products that started out in one sort of domain are evolving into others, is actually happening through these acquisitions as well. Um, so, uh, you know, just to focus on Europe for, for a second, um, you know, Europe is about one sixth of the global spend in, in education. Um, traditionally speaking, it's been a little bit behind in terms of digital penetration in schools, um, relative to the U S certainly, um, and outside of the Nordic region, we're actually, um, uh, uh, ed tech penetration in schools is quite high, but for most of continental Europe, it's, it's been relatively low. Um, you know, that being said, it, it, it's growing actually more quickly, um, and uh, then then on some other parts of the world um one thing that i won't dwell on too much but is worth mentioning is that there's been a, a big crackdown in china recently on um on actually just the licensing of education technology companies which means that actually um the us um india and uh, europe are likely to see more more um venture capital dollars in, in the future um uh, certainly relative to china where the, the landscape has become quite um, much more difficult to to operate in. Um, you've seen a 21x increase in ed tech investment, um, and and you have an increasing number of um, sort of valuable companies. Companies that have been able to raise 50 million plus rounds um, across the, the ed tech landscape. And so, so yeah, this is what I was talking about before. You actually, I think you you quoted a statistic um, this about the, the amount of ed tech uh, investment that's happened in Europe this this year. I think our latest statistic shows it's about 1.7 billion actually, um, and the year is not up yet versus uh, 700 million last year. So it's a really quite an, an increase in terms of the amount of investment that's happening in the space. Um, I think it just, uh, I won't go through all these predictions, but in terms of how we see this, this universe evolving, um, we, we think in terms of uh, the, the distance learning and after school tools, there's gonna be uh, the amount of exposure that parents and students have had to those tools it's meant that actually the, the barriers to adoption have come down permanently. And so we, we think there's, there's gonna continue to be a lot of spending around that. Um, we think uh, there's a continued unbundling of post-secondary education, which means the options for learning um, a profession, um, you know, outside of a traditional university setting, um, whether it's uh, honestly a tech-related profession or a blue-collar-related profession, um, that kind of training will increasingly happen online, um, whether it's as an alternative to college or to university or as a supplement to it. Um, and then um, I think one of the sort of more interesting trends for me is just um, community learning is actually increasingly um, interesting for, for folks. So it's not just about going to a website or going uh, or even um, signing up for a live course um, and and um, learning something online. It's increasingly about joining a community of people who are interested in learning um, uh, the same thing that you're um, interested in learning about. And that, you know, you can look at companies like OutSchool in the U.S. for for for. Um, for younger children, or you can look at um, uh, companies like uh, Hack the Box, which is a, a community of, of cybersecurity experts, essentially, who, who hack uh, on, on uh, tools uh, t together um, and compete with one another around that. So, so I think there's, there's just um, a really a, a increasing amount of interest around creating communities of learning, which, which, is, which is really interesting and something that we're definitely looking at and investing in. Um, so I think my time is up, so I will, I will end it there. And I'm going to try to make a smooth transition to our next guest, <laughs> um, who, who is um, uh, Alberto. Alberto is the co-founder of, of Genially. Um, uh, Genially was was founded in 2015 at, um, and has grown now to over 14 million uh, users, uh, the majority of whom are educators and students. Um, many of you are, are likely familiar with that. 
Um, I, I think uh, uh, they're, they're uh, announcing a, a funding round today, which we participated in and are quite happy about. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if, if I've, I've sort of jumped the gun there, but I think I think I'm, I can hand it off to Alberto now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Manuel. Uh, thank you very much, um, Bright Eye and all the organization for inviting us. It's a real pleasure. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, give me a second. Okay. Okay, so yeah, uh, we are very happy for being here. Um, I'm going to, to present genially the tool that brings content to life. Um, this is, um, I'm, I'm very lucky because actually uh, at the same time that I'm doing uh, um, the presentation and also doing a product demo because it's, this has been all, this presentation has been developed also uh, obviously with Genially as you can see here. Okay, uh, well, we, we think that there are two ways of, of teach and learn with content in the classrooms. Um, as you can see here with the static content, the traditional, traditional way of teaching and, and learning, um, you can see a lot of text, uh, long text, um, a plain image and a link that takes you out of, of the creation. Yeah, this is quite boring. And in this, in this uh, example, made with Genially, um, interactive content, you have layers of information. You have tooltips, you have windows. Um, the, the communication here becomes an experience uh, because, for example, you, can, you have a video here that reproduces its place in the, in the, same, in the very same creation, this video. Quite funny, by the way, explaining, <laughs> explaining the cell, <laughs> as you can see here. So as I was saying, um, the communication here becomes an experience be between among the, the user, the, the teacher and the student. So to sum up, we say that with static content, you bore and um, with interactive content, you engage in the classrooms. The thing is that the problem um, before Genially was that interactive content is hard and expensive to develop because you either need coding or and uh, and design background and knowledge, or you have to pay for it. Um, give me two seconds to explain how Genially um, starts. Uh, Genially starts from another another um, consultancy firm. Um, actually, when it was a, a communication agency, we developed developed um, materials and content for for companies and for education organizations. Uh, once the the content was created. Our, our customers said, okay, I want to edit that uh, material that you have developed, but, developing. but they couldn't because they didn't have the, the background. So that's why we like to say that we are democratizing the creation of interactive content because now it's simple and affordable for everyone. You don't have to be an, a genius to create uh, awesome things like this one uh, that you are saying. Everyone without any knowledge in this uh, field can create awesome things. So you can create um, uh, material uh, with an excellent uh, result without uh, this knowledge. Um, we have concentrated the, the power of Office Hour. If you go to Genially, everything is familiar. It reminds you to the software you are used to it with the, with, with the power of web technology. And we have created a um, tool that is probably the more versatile tool in the market for content creation. This at the beginning was a very uh, quite nightmare because we had to face a lot of different um, different uh, uh, challenges. But now the, this is is giving us a, a very um, differentiation point in the market. With Genially, you can create not just presentations but also dossiers, learning experiences, gamifications. Um, any kind of interactive images and, and so on. So we can say that we solve the problem, not just by uh, that, in the fact that uh, everyone can create any kind of content, but also we save money and we save time because um, we can easily uh, save uh, like two, five or six different tools for, for the education content. Um, we give what we say for um, superpowers to, <laughs> to our users. The first one is interactivity, as I was mentioning before. When a person is interacting with the, with the creation, 
they are living an exploratory process. So if you explore what you are reading, you remember uh, faster uh, what you are what you are exploring. So um, at the end of the day, what everyone wants uh, when creates content is to be memorable, right? So with interactivity, interactivity for us is crucial. Also, we think that the communication, the online communication, should be a little bit interactivity, interactivity because and um, this is uh, we interact when we are speaking, right? We we speak and the other one listen and then they speak. So interactivity is crucial for the communication. Also, animation is very important. This is, for example, this is a video presentation, but it seems a video. Um, you know, uh, when we are um, watching something that is moving uh, with um, with a normal uh, movement, um, it's eye catching. So, uh, what is moving, we remember it uh, faster and easier. Monitoring is also very important to uh, to planify what you are um, promoting and when you, what you are speaking about in the future, what is working and what is not. And integration is also a, a very interesting. Superpower, for example, this is the um, Nordic Expo, Expo uh, Twitter timeline. This is uh, this is something that we embed, we have embedded here. You can embed almost everything into genially, and you can embed genially into almost uh, everything, like LMSs, web blogs, and and so on. So, um, inter um, integration is a key part of of genially too. Um, for example, um, also there is something differentiation uh, about Genially is that we are not just a tool, but we have integrated technology and, and methodology. For example, storytelling. Um, the human being is a great consumer of stories. The, mo the most of the conversation that's, that we have every day are stories and we are used to consume stories. So with Genially, it's very easy to tell stories and and to to you know to to set a storytelling um, content. Also, gamification. Why not? People like to learn with with fun and with generally. It's very easy to to set gamification experiences in the classroom and to promote much more particip participatory classes and collaboration collaborative classes and and classrooms. At the end of the day. Uh, as I was saying, the, the human being is a is a group of a group of being, and we we like and we love to learn all together. And it's uh, really really simple. With uh, generally, it, everything is drag and drop. What you hear, what you get, you have thousands of resources and thousands thousands of uh, of templates. Um, we like to say that um, almost. Um, all the work is done with Genially before because you can find a, a template with, uh, for your topic very easily. We say that it's magically simple to, to use Genially. You don't have to be a genius to create awesome, awesome content. And uh, speaking a little bit about um, our global impact, we have, uh, as uh, Benoit was mentioning before, more than 14 million users around the world in more than in almost 200 countries in worldwide also we have 35 millions of creations and more than almost 2 million of visualizations this is bringing us more and more users every day and we have a very uh, important clients like um, the university uh, of monterey um, also a couple of universities uh, in well a lot of universities in the states that are becoming more and heavy users so yeah, our impact in this moment is uh, is global. Well, speaking a little bit of our story, we started in 2015. We founded the, um, the the company and launched our beta version. And in the in that very year, in that year, we got the first 20,000, uh, 50,000 users. The, our team was uh, five people by that way. In 2016, um, we did our first investment round of bi of business angels uh, for 100 100,000 um, euros. We already had in that time 300,000 users with 10 people of team. In, two, in 2017, where our tool was much more mature, we started our monetization strategy. 
Um, it is based basic, basically in two strategies, product-led growth plus a bottom-up strategy with a team of sales and customer development. Uh, by uh, by 2017, we had 15 people in our team. In 2018, we did our seed, seed investment round with uh, for 1.2 million euros. We already uh, raised uh, 1.3 million users with a team of 25 people. And in 2019. Uh, we opened a new office in, in, in the States, in, the, in New York, and we opened uh, our U.S. affiliate company. It's true that um, the COVID-19, um, well, <laughs> actually, you don't need an office to be worldwide in this moment, but uh, we have presence there, and we are expanding our network in the States uh, since 2019. We, were to, we got 2.7 million users and a team of 40 people. In 2020, our uh, our product is very, very much mature, and this is uh, also giving us the opportunity to grow even faster. We are growing really, really fast in this moment. Uh, last year, we raised a Series A round of, of investment for 4.4 million euros, and we were 20 people in their team. And this year, uh, we have. I'm very happy to announce that today we are announced. We are announcing in the press that we we have raised uh, 20 million dollars uh, in a Series B round of investment. And uh, this is uh, yeah, <laughs> like the first new we give uh, publicly uh, in public in this moment. We have more than 14 million users with a team of uh, 145 people. Uh, our, mar our marketing approach um, is um, based in variety. We have um, the, the, the very business model and is a teacher that creates for students. Those students um, will create for other students and other teachers, so more and more people come. We have built a huge community of people that are hooked to the product and they, they really love the product. This is our real heritage, the community that we have built around the product and people are that are very millions of people that are very happy with the, with the product and it's um, they are using it in the in their normal life uh, for for prof for professional and individual use. Also, we have as I said millions of URLs with our logo here that are bringing us more and more users. Every day we get, we do more than 35,000 new users a day, which is, uh, we are very happy for that. Uh, we think that is very good in this moment, this kind of, of numbers. And content management, marketing, we partner with uh, influencers in the sectors and influencers in the in the different verticals and segments in the in the field to, to partner with them and to write content. So... Yeah, um, most of our of our marketing approach is viral. Uh, speaking a bit about our monetization, we have um, more than 500,000 um, 500, K MRR in this moment. We have projected uh, for million uh, euros in revenue for this year. As you can see here, um, COVID-19 affected us very positively. But it's true that we are maintaining the, the growth more or less. So, yeah, we advanced with COVID-19. Um, we took advantage in this in this sense. And uh, we are keeping the, the growth. We have been awarded um, in several, in, in many different countries, uh, in Spain, in London. For example, we got the first jury and public award in, in H Award in London last year. And we have been winner of the EgTech Digest awards in the in the like the best presentation tool in the US also this year. I would like to show you a couple of a couple of samples. Um, I'm the first one is the very the most the most simple one the, the most simple creation you, you can create with Genially. This is an interactive image. It's very simple, but at the same time it's effect it's effective. You have an image. This is a GIF image. You can upload very easy. And they have em embedded here, they have embedded uh, a map, a Google map, so they can, people, everyone can know where the Grand Canyon is. Also, they have embedded a video speaking about uh, the Grand Canyon, 
and how I said. So I was saying very simple, but, but very effective. And the second one is a um, um, much more advanced uh, use of Genially. It's a breakout. It's a escape room. We're going to, to go through it a little bit, just for two minutes. Uh, escape room imposter, start. OK, warning, warning. An alien has entered our ship and is trying to, to impersonate the crew. So we need to know what body is in, is in it and get rid of, of it before it takes control of everyone. We cannot return to Earth until we are sure it's not one of us. OK, let's go for it. OK, close the hatch. You have, the, but there is a problem. We have gotten to the password, and we need to correctly answer all the questions in order to recover it. Let's go. You have to answer this, these questions. In which country are the rings of Sparta located? OK, great. In, it's starting to be closed. In which museum can you find the Mona Lisa? OK. At what century did the Renaissance start in? Wow. Now you are the imposter. Try again. <laughs> you try again. OK, the process by which a cell is divided um, to form two form two cells is called mitosis. Good work. The hatch is closed. Next, now you pass to the to the next room. So now, for example, identify the imposter. I'm famous for painting for paintings. Guess who is lying about this statement? I guess Arton Senna. OK, look for the alien. Where is the alien? Where is the alien? Here. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, quite um, quite more uh, quite more uh, advanced use of, of Genially, as you can say. But you can create um, from the very very most most simple creation from the very most uh, comprehensive one to engage the classrooms in uh, with your students and also if you are a student in the higher education, you can impress your your public. In this case, your your teachers. So nothing else. Thank you very much. And thank you, Alberto. This was a good presentation and I'm very pleased to notice that I were, was able to, you know, have the correct answers on this little test that you made. <laughs> and I'm going safely out in space now, I think. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's um, very good for your culture. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm hoping to get Benoit uh, Wiers back with us. So uh, we're trying to switch you uh, with Benoit. And there you are. No, he's coming soon. And also here in the studio, we have uh, Nils Floor with us and Tom Daniel Lögru together with Andrew and me. And we're going to have a little discussion about some of the issues that has come up now. And uh, we go to you first, Benoit. As uh, we've heard in these presentations from you and Alberto, uh, we heard that there is big, big money in EdTech. And uh, I wonder how much do you worry about delivering tools that teachers actually need? Yeah, well, I mean, I think they 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 only make money to the extent that they work. I mean, that's that's at the end of the day, um, a lot of this is is really driven by teacher adoption. I mean, genially, which you which you saw is really it's a bottom up strategy, right? Teachers adopt it first. Um, there's a free version of the product, and then once you get a certain critical mass, you, you sell into schools. Um, and but it's the teachers themselves who do the convincing. Um, and so so, um, you know, I guess I'm I'm uh, I'm worried about it because I I worry that all the products that we um, you know, that, that we invest in um, have to work. Um, otherwise, you know, they, they can't grow. Um, but I'm not overly worried that ed tech, um, you know, the, the ed tech companies that are getting funded aren't actually performing a service because it's, it's actually the service that they're providing which enables the growth. So you do actually work with teachers to, to make uh, the tools very useful for learning in the classroom? Yeah, I mean, again, a lot of these, so what really changed in the U.S. Um, from when I started in 2010 was, was there was a massive increase in broadband penetration in classrooms, which went from like 20% of classrooms having broadband access to 98% of classrooms having broadband access in a really short period of time, in three or four years. And so for the first time, what that meant is um, teachers were not bound by um, the head of IT of the school or you know, even the head of IT of the district in terms of what tools that they could they could actually use. Um, they could, you know, because they had you know, broadband access in the classroom and devices in the classroom, they could choose for themselves what, what they saw as, as um, really useful. And that actually had a really um, powerful business impact because it meant that instead of 
you know, sales cycles that took a year because you had to, you know, meet the head of the school and convince them that this was an important tool without them having much actually knowledge of the product. You could go to the head of the school and say, hey, look, 10 percent of your teachers are already using this product. Um, don't you think you want something more powerful? Don't you think you want to um, sort of spread that to the rest of the school? Because, you know, we know that the teachers that are using it are getting value out of it. And so um, it was that that change that really actually um, brought the first wave of interest into um, uh, ed tech tools for the classroom from um, private investors because it meant sales cycles went from over a year to under three months and it was much more scalable and growable. So you're actually touching, touching upon one big issue that we discussed a little bit here in the studio is that you give your tools for free for a period of time and then people love the use of them and then you s suddenly say, hey, you have to pay. So how do you deal with that? Uh, because it's first free and then suddenly it costs money. Yeah, I mean, I think like I think the expectation that um, software should uh, sort of always be free is 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 a weird one, honestly. It's it's not like people expect like the chairs or the blackboards or the you know buildings that schools are to be free. It's not like they expect you know the, the construction company that builds the school to not make a profit, right? Like it, you know, um, all that stuff is useful. I mean, I think if the situation were reversed, right, and we had only known online schooling. Um, and and there you know all of a sudden actually it was revealed to people that actually having a physical building um and you know putting chairs in that building and putting blackboards in that building was actually a really useful way for people to learn you know they, it's hard for me to imagine that people be like oh but you have to pay people money for that and they're going to make money for that and so we should do it um is weird right um you know i, I think actually um the, the fact that that the, the, the technology works means you know um that that it's because it works that you should pay for it and and you know be, the fact that you get access to some of it for free is great because it gives people more exposure to it um but it doesn't mean that it can be endlessly free and actually if, if it was endlessly free you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to increase the functionality because there wouldn't be enough revenue for those companies that are building the product but just to follow up on that benoit do you not see that that's potentially quite a challenging situation for a school because teachers come to rely on a product being free and I completely agree with you software shouldn't be free and if it has value in terms of learning then schools should be prepared to pay for it but when the kind of business model seems to be that teachers kind of almost get hooked to it for a couple of years for free and then suddenly there comes a charge for using something that they've come to rely on in their classroom that's potentially quite problematic in a school yeah i mean i, I guess I, I i think that's um I, I, well the, the the products that i'm familiar with are, are usually um the the payments for an individual teacher don't vary very much right and when that if you're at an individual teacher level you're never paying a whole lot honestly it's, it's usually within the discretionary budget of, of, of the teacher i think um you know, the, the, what you, when you start to pay is when you have a school level access or, or district level access. And for me, that seems like a reasonable business model. You know, I, I, I understand what you're saying. My, my mom's a teacher. I spent part of the reason I'm interested in the in the uh, yep. in, in, in the whole uh, sphere was I, I understood both how rewarding and how hard the job is um, and how much you invest in, in actually, um, you know, making sure that y your students are, are learning and, and the materials that you prepare for your students. Um, but but I do think, you know, it's a sort of a it's a process, right? Um, the more st uh, teachers are exposed to it, the more value they see in it, the more they can advocate for it um, to um, district, you know, to the schools and the districts that they, you know, that actually hold the purse strings, um, and the more the purse strings open up, right? And and yeah. so I, I think unless you put some barriers in place, you don't actually evolve in the process. And so you know, it's it's not perfect, but I, I think it's it's kind of uh, the the level of friction that exists today seems acceptable to me. And Benoit, there, uh, there's one other issue that we kind of want to air with you before you go, and that's the GDPR issue, because we've dis discussed that thoroughly here yesterday. And it's very hard for schools and small communities to handle GDPR requirements. Would you ask from your developers to, to take care of that before they sell the products so that when the schools get the, get the new uh, software, that the GDPR issue is sorted? Yeah, I mean, I think I think you know, honestly, for for um, software that's being built in Europe, usually GDPR is you know sort of handling G GDPR is built in. I, I really don't see that as a big issue, at least for for most of the, the companies that we see, uh, honestly, that, that are based here. I think for American companies, it tends to be a bigger issue because you know, obviously, they, they build a, a a big product and often get quite a bit of traction before they they come across GDPR, and so so they, it tend, they, when you have to um, uh, sort of uh, do it. Uh, you sort of confront that a little later on in product development. It 
can be more expensive and take more time. But, um, but you, I think would one you of the, require that from uh, companies from, say, Asia or, or the U.S.? Uh, I mean, so we don't we don't invest in companies in Asia. I think we only invest in companies um, where we believe that there's a, a market for them in Europe. Um, and and so for companies that, I, it's not that we would require it from day one um, because you know it doesn't make sense to say, hey, we're only going to give you this money if you've already done this thing that we know you need to do to enter the market that we want you to enter into. Um, but I think part of what what our um, capital goes to is actually giving them um, the ability to develop what they need uh, to comply with GDPR. Cool, thank you. I know Tom Daniel here has a question also for you. Stay on. Tom Daniel, sure. go on. <laughs> Hi there. I was wondering uh, about how do you see the role of um, you when you're investing in private companies, not only for specific software, but how do you see your role in investing in something that can actually give uh, me as a student valuable work experience and life skills that I can take from, especially which is, more, as I would say, more relevant in a university level to take into when I start working? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's a good question. We, we invest a lot in companies that, um, I guess I think about it in two parts, right? Um, one is um, invest, we invest in a lot in companies that um, provide skills that are just more in demand in the workforce um, that are both honestly accredited and unaccredited. So, so um, companies like Ironhack, which is a, a boot camp for, for tech skills um, um, that started in Spain and which um, honestly has a had a 90% placement uh, job placement rate within six months of completion. Companies like um, uh, uh, Econoclass, which is a sort of a boot camp for um, sales, uh, particularly software sales um, skills, and which has, I think, a 98% uh, job placement rate at the moment. So it's kind of crazy. Uh, that, that is a particularly booming area. Um, and so, so part of it is honestly just the relevance of the skills that you're acquiring. And then part of it is also the uh, the experience that you're having in um, the, the boot camp itself. So for things like software development, it's hard to provide hands-on um, sort of experience, particularly at a very entry level, um, because you just need a certain base level of, of skills before um, before you are able to contribute. But actually, uh, what's interesting about Econoclass is because they're doing business development, you know, after two weeks, um, you can actually, you know, part of the training is working with um actual software companies and, you know, working their leads and qualifying their leads and actually landing sales for software companies. So while you're in the boot camp and what that means is a, you're getting, you know, really hands-on experience and B actually the reason they have such a high placement rate is the companies that are doing um, the, the training um, are the ones that are hiring then immediately out of the boot camp and they know the students already. Right. And so, um, so I think as a standalone experience, um, there are a lot of those that we invest in. Um, there are starting to be more uh, um, sort of efforts to embed that kind of experience inside of a university, um, but we haven't invested in any yet, although I, I would, I'd be really surprised if we didn't do it out of this fund. Um, so those are companies like Forthrev um, and uh, uh, I'm trying to think about this, Trinity out of the U.S., um, a few others that are, that are doing that. Okay, yeah, because there's been a quite a big focus in, especially in Norway, for push a push towards uh, that universities should have more on-the-job training, more practical skills that can actually take into uh, the workforce instead of just having the th theoretical skills. That's why I'm wondering what you th uh, thought about that investing in those types of software. Yeah, I'm all, I'm all for it. I'm all for it, and I think you know, honestly, but like universities should do it without our investment, right? Like that's what yeah. universities should be doing anyway. <laughs> um, 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 we, we, yeah, there's only so much we can solve with our money, but but I, I you know I think for for there are kind of these more um, cookie cutter programs that are trying to make it easier for for universities to do that, and we're certainly interested in that, and they're they're being funded um, quite aggressively across the, across the world, which is which is good. Okay, to see. Uh, Benoit, thank you. I think we actually have a date now between you and Tom Daniel later, so I'm hooking you up. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Thank you awesome. So Great. <laughs> thank you so much for being a part of um, of NoHo EdTech here uh, today. And we're going to go over here in the studio and talk about uh, the issues that uh, Nils and Tom Daniel brought up. And um, one of the things that I really thought uh, about when I heard you, Nils, uh, uh, you talked a lot about emotions. So uh, I want you guys to reflect a little bit emotions in teaching. And why is emotion so important? Well, um, like I said in my talk, that um, emotion has huge impact on how we uh, experience things. You know, just uh, think about when you're in love. You know, uh, you just uh, met uh, the person of your dreams. Everything is different, completely different than when they break up with you. Everything is completely different again. 
So how you feel influences how you learn and also what you learn. So um, I uh, really try to make a connection with learners both on a cognitive level, which is essential, otherwise they won't you know, understand things, learn things. But I also want to make a connection on, a, uh, on an emotional level. So asking the question not just what are you going to learn from this experience, but also how is this experience going to make you feel? Is it going to make you feel better? What are you getting out of this experience besides, let's say, the learning, uh, reaching learning objectives? And a learning outcome should be about you know, improving your life, having an impact on who you are, changing who you are. So you're saying that feelings will make it easier to learn. Is that what you're saying? Or well, you need to take them into account. Um, because l the example I gave, well, if you take emotions out of experiences, it becomes really like flat and sterile. And there's n so um, if you want to offer someone an experience that really uh, impacts them, that really uh, you know, uh, changes something in, 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 in who they are, their life, their knowledge, their skills, their, the way they view things, the way they behave, then you can use emotions as a way to, to kind of uh, channel that, to, to focus that. And if students fail at things, Nils, is that always a negative experience? And is that valuable or...? Well, I probably learned the most from my failures. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think uh, failure is a bit of a double-edged sword uh, because you want to do your best, you want to succeed. But if you fail, um, you know, there's a lot to learn there. So learning from failure can be su such a powerful experience. And I think um, w I do quite a bit for, for let's say, corporate uh, learning experiences. And sometimes we get the feedback that, you know, we don't want, sometimes we set people up for failure to experience that and to learn from that. And sometimes they won't allow us because they say, well, our people don't, they, they would feel really poorly about themselves when they fail at something. So we just need to uh, make it more successful and friendly, which I understand. You need to, so I, I'm not there to say you need to fail to learn this, but I'm there to, to figure out so what would be the best way for these people to learn. And if they, if they have a really negative association with failure, then no, don't use it. I think it's also a lot easier when you, if you can connect to the curriculum or connect to the topic on a personal level from personal experience, it's a lot easier to get engaged and it's a lot when you, if you, if you, if you can get excited about something, if the teacher can get you excited, if the topic can get you excited, it's a lot easier to remember, it's a lot easier to retain knowledge. I've sat through lectures where m m they might not have uh, aroused an excitement uh, in <laughs> me so much that I was uh, uh, maybe 20% would stick after that session. But yeah, we've had a great question from the audience actually that I'd like to kind of direct at both of you, which is knowing what you both know, how would how should we change how we train teachers? Wow, that's a big question. Ooh. It is a very big question. <laughs> You, well. have, you have to be very specific because they're wrapping up. Yeah, okay. So I think um, we should look at the... We should train teachers to be able to, um, to be creative, to create their own experiences and not maybe depend on, let's say, standard methods or tools and really to... Um, we've just seen examples of great uh, companies who uh, were invested uh, invest in, in all kinds of tools if you're able to, to make the right choices because you know what you want to achieve, then you can pick the right tools and you can really uh, you know, teach in an authentic way, in a personal way. And um, so, yeah, g you know, trust the, uh, the, the, give them some liberty, uh, give them some, have, let them have some fun and be creative. I think maybe from my background, I'd say maybe take a page out of uh, the PR and marketing handbook in terms of how can you adapt a complex topic to the whatever user users you're targeting the the at. So, for example, that means how can you boil something down to the very essence and get the the core out of it. And so that's something they could maybe include uh, that's currently being taught for PR and marketing. Thank you. That's some great input from Nils Flora and Tom Daniel Lögrud. And uh, we're going to be uh, moving on now. And um, enough talk. It's time to play. Uh, we'll get a visit from uh, Paolo uh, 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 Scarbocci, director of the Didactic Digital EduLab at the University of Stavanger, and two of his students. 
Kaya Urs Faragen and Vegar Haugen Bjørge, and they brought us this. Paolo, you are now here with us, and uh, you are in what we call the, the, the Didactic Digital Edu Lab at the University of Stavanger. What is that? Well, uh, we call, call ourselves a future classroom lab, uh, so we try to look into the future, and we try to define how schools and teacher education should be maybe five years ahead, ten years ahead, twenty years ahead. So. Uh, yeah. Wow, that's exciting. Yeah, it is. And uh, we also, within our didactic lab, we, uh, we have practical workshops. Uh, we uh, do things together with our students. Uh, we try out new technology. Um, and we try to collect data on how we should use these new tools in schools. Because people ask me, how do you know these things work? And I don't know if it works yet, but uh, we need to uh, try it out first. And uh, so we also have uh, strategic uh, partnerships with schools in, uh, in our area where we try out, for instance, our games. And you brought us something today. Yep. Show me what it is. Uh, we have brought our computer uh, guidance, uh, which made our computer game guidebook. Um, that we have just developed, yeah, uh, or in Norwegian, data spill uh, which is meant to be a support for teacher educators, uh, teacher students, and uh, the teachers within the schools today, because they uh, don't know much about how to use games, and we also need to help them in how to, uh, w what games they should use in the different subjects and on different levels. Uh, so this is meant to be uh, some kind of support for them. And we're going to give away this guide exclusively to all of you who are watching now. And you can find it for downloading on the KnowHow EdTech website. And it will soon be available in the languages Norwegian, English and Spanish. And if you want a guide in proper print, like I have in my hand now, have also a look at our website. But first, Kaya and Vegar, you will show us what the guide on computer games in the classroom is all about. Please go ahead. Thank yeah. you. Paolo. Yeah, so I can, can start. just uh, start and say that uh, our guidance or guidebook for teachers here is uh, meant to support the teachers, uh, as I said, uh, both in the in, in the schools and also in the teacher education. Uh, and we have done the work, or my students here have done the work uh, with sorting out which games uh, can be used on different levels and on uh, different age groups. Uh, and it's a big work just to sort this out. So we have, uh, we started it in uh, 2017. So we worked for a few years by sorting out which games should be used and could be used and how to use them. Um, and this uh, Kaya and Berger can tell us more about. Uh, yeah, uh, so as mentioned before, uh, the uh, book catalog is coming out in three different languages. Uh, the first one is the Norwegian one, which we are planning to release now this November, this year. And uh, early next year, we plan to release the English version and after that, the Spanish version sometime, but in the same year, 2022. Um, uh, also, not every person or teacher is as technically gifted as others, so we also plan to have a printed physical version as well. Uh, this could benefit all teachers for actually having the book with them into classrooms, sharing them with students so they can actually pick up a physical book and read it, just not to scroll through it in a uh, digital page. Yeah, and we have tried to give uh, teachers uh, some good reasons for using games in the, in the education. Uh, we believe that uh, 
we should recognize that games are a kind of hybrid or advanced texts that are relevant for our time uh, and the future ahead. Uh, and it's, uh, we know that children use a lot of time uh, to play games and we should uh, try it to connect with them uh, and um, see what we can play together with them in the classroom. Uh, and so, uh, for instance, we know that uh, a Norwegian game called Embracelet have uh, 28,000 words. Uh, so we kind of forget sometimes that there are a lot of reading uh, in the games. It's not only about the visual elements in the game, it's also a lot of text. And uh, this is a good way for uh, to make our students and um, pupils to read uh, by having uh, these pictures along and also interact in the game. Yes. Next. So, uh, the book is designed like this. Uh, the great uh, graphical designer Gloria has made this. Uh, and it's um, designed to be easily accessible um, for even the teachers who don't usually use games. So it's divided into age groups. The age groups here are uh, accordingly to the Norwegian schools. Uh, and also I the subjects are illustrated. Uh, I'll give you one example from the book. This is the game and bracelet. In the blue bracket, you'll have information about the game. Uh, and also, uh, in the next bracket, there's um, we have found some elements from the curricular curriculum uh, with in where you can use the game. And we have some teaching suggestions under. On the right side, you'll find information about the game and we, in which subjects we recommend it, and also in what plot platforms you'll find them. Uh, and the illustration to the far right uh, shows which age group we recommend the games for. So here is just a, another example. Uh, the layout is the same. And this is from a game called Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes, uh, which is essentially about uh, one person is assigned as a bomb diffusal specialist and needs to describe to the rest of the group uh, what the bomb looks like. And the rest of the groups are sitting with uh, printed uh, books that explains how uh, this person needs to diffuse it. If not, he will explode. So this gives uh, students uh, great opportunities for working in groups, uh, great communication skills, and uh, uh, working on their oral language because the game also comes in different languages. And it, it creates an opportunity to have uh, the uh, interdisciplinary topics and bringing them together. And also very cool about uh, Keep Talking, it also supports VR. So the person who looks at the bomb has a VR headset on him and can actually physically pick up the bomb and watch it in 3D space while describing to the rest of the group what it looks like. Um, yeah, I told that. Can I add something? Add something, please. Uh, I forgot to show you. Oh, it doesn't show up. But we will also, in the catalog or in the um, book, uh, give you some keywords for the games. For example, in the Embracelet game, uh, it, uh, you can, because in Norway we use these interdisciplinary topics and we also have the basic skills. So we're, we'll, we will mark them with keywords so that they're, uh, f the, it will be easy to find games that are suitable for different topics and um, we also try out the games uh, in schools. So we have done a computer game or video game pilot uh, together with the creator of uh, Embracelet, Mattis Folkestad. Um, so we also go behind the scenes, you could say, and uh, the, the pupils in the schools can meet the producers behind the games. Uh, it's also an option here. So we try to look at every, uh, every part of what a computer game or video game can be. Yeah. Uh, thank you for us. Uh, if you want to contact us, uh, it says here on our email, uh, ddv one at uis.no. Please don't hesitate to ask us anything. And uh, please don't hesitate to come in as well at UIS. Thank you. Thank you. We've
We've actually had a question ah, for you yeah. from the audience, yeah. which was uh, when you said that you included different age groups in the guide, have you included anything for adults in adult education? Uh, yeah, so we are planning to add more games before the release. Mm. Uh, some games I have added now are more, uh, let's say, uh, aimed for older audience with more violence and yeah, that sort of stuff. Yep. So uh, we are planning to cover the whole spectrum from the first class to all the way up to adults, yeah. Fantastic. Cool. Good to interact with our viewers. Thank you so much, Kaya, Vega, and Paolo. And remember to get the game guide from our website and get some gaming into the classroom. Next, Gunvald Dvarsnes is a podcaster and a PhD fellow researching podcasting in the classroom. He is here now to share his learning, get all his best tips on how to get started with educational podcasting. Jeg tror jeg var 13 år gammel da jeg begynte å lytte til podcaster. Og husk på at da var det fortsatt sånn at du måtte laste ned podcasterne fra iTunes, manuelt flytte dem over til en minnebrikke, og så legge minnebrikken inn i en iPod for mitt velkommende. Og så hørte jeg på podcaster på vei hjem fra skolen for eksempel. Jeg er så heldig at jeg får lov til å forske på podcast i skolen. Og i dag har jeg tenkt å dele den gleden med dere. Og rett og slett ta deg med ut på en skole der elevene ikke bare er dyktige på å bygge hus, men også på å lage drivende gode podcaster. Nå befinner vi oss på Gann videregående skole. Og rett bak meg her, inne i produksjonshallen, så sitter det en herlig gjeng med byggfagselever. Og de lager podcaster. For en trenger altså ikke dyre mikrofoner eller store studier for å lage podcaster i skolen. En trenger bare en telefon. Ettersom disse elevene her også er over 16 år, og har gitt samtykke til offentlig publisering, så kan de ta i bruk en app som heter Anchor. Og den lar elevene spille inn, eventuelt redigere, og distribuere podcasten i etterkant. Og da er podcasten plutselig tilgjengelig på for eksempel Spotify. Hei, hei, og velkommen til denne podcasten. I dag skal vi ha det her med yrkestikk, så følg med. Og det synes jeg er spennende å tenke på. At elevene får et reelt publikum på det de her lager. De får det vi kaller for autentiske mottagere. Det skjer ikke så ofte i skolen. At elever får et publikum som går utover på si, klasserommets fire vegger, stort sett, så lager elever ting i skolen som er beregnet på lærerne sine, eller kanskje på medelevene sine. Et annet poeng som jeg har lyst til å nevne er at når en ber elever lage podcaster i skolen, så blir de produsenter og ikke konsumenter av faglig innhold. Og er det noe vi vet om gode læringsprosesser, så er det akkurat det at elevene trenger å være aktivt skapende i prosessen. Det er da det blir best. Hvorfor er yrkesetikk viktig på arbeidsplassen? En annen ting som dukker opp når en undersøker det her med å bruke podcast i skolen, det er at elever forteller at de setter pris på det kreative aspektet ved å lage podcaster. Altså bruke av jingler, de kan legge inn lydeffekter, bakgrunnsmusikk og så videre. Altså det å ramme inn podcasten lydmessig. Det forteller de at de synes det er veldig, veldig gøy. Elevene forteller også at de kjenner seg trygge på podcastformatet med tanke på vurdering. Og det har rett og slett sammenheng med hvordan arbeidsprosessen er fram til podcasten er lagt. For ikke sant vel, om disse elevene her opplever at et oppdrag gikk galt, så kan de jo bare spille inn det oppdraget på nytt, eller redigere i oppdraget bort det de ikke vil ha. Og dermed er det mange elever som senker skuldrene litt, og som opplever at de får tid og anledning til å si det de ønsker å si. Og dermed så får de også vist kompetansen sin. Og så uformelt som dette kan en også jobbe med podcast i skolen. Og så tror jeg vi bare skal la elevene få jobbe i fred her nå, og så tar vi turen tilbake igjen til universitetet. Og nå befinner vi oss i podcaststudioet til Universitetet i Stavanger. Her spiller jeg inn min egen podcast, Klar, ferdig undervis. Og i den så snakker jeg med fagpersoner og lærere i skolen som har et brennende engasjement for norsk faget. Det synes jeg er gøy. Så podcast trenger ikke å være så veldig vanskelig. Så her tenker jeg at vi som driver med undervisning og bryr oss om undervisning, vi har jo et kjempepotensiale. Thank you, Gunval. Andrew, I'm wondering, would you consider podcasts relevant for the classroom? Is that a tool that we can use? Yeah, I think so. As we've just seen, lots of good reasons as to why podcasting could be a really useful tool in the classroom. And as we've also heard this afternoon, 
not all students learn in the same way so actually giving them different ways to show understanding I think is uh, yeah really valuable. Many people see podcasts as a hype what do you think will it stick with us? Uh, well <laughs> it's funny as we were talking about the other day I actually as a teacher used podcasting 12 years ago so I think it's been around for a while and that quite a lot of educators are already using it. Okay good to know. Um, so now you know all about podcasting and if you want to hear Gunwald who is our PhD expert he has his uh, podcast in Norwegian though but uh, you can find it at podcast.uis.no. We're coming to the end of our two days of NoHo EdTech, but uh, one question is still remaining. Was the step to the web that teachers and students took during the pandemic the beginning of a new era of education and a digital disruption that we hardly can sense the range of? Or is the widespread use of online tools we've seen during the pandemic finally the end of the digital revolution? And that we, from now on, will see a practice in education where the web and educational technology is an indisputable normal. To point us in the direction of an answer, we've got no less than the Can Canada Research Chair in Innovative Learning and Technology, Dr. George Velizianos. Dr. Velizianos is a professor in the School of Education and Technology at Royal Roads University, not so far from Vancouver in Canada. Along the top is topics we've discussed today, he recently also has published a book with the title Learning Online, the Student Experience. So here is Dr. Valiziano, all the way from Victoria, British Columbia. Hi everyone, thanks for having me and for allowing me to visit from the westernmost coast of Canada. Today I'll be speaking about online and blended learning in our current context and in our post-pandemic settings. I'll first provide some context as to where we are, where we might be headed. I'll wrap my discussion on student voices, and in particular, the notion of interactivity, resiliency, and flexibility. I was asked to respond to the prompt, the digital revolution is over, a phrase that pays homage to Nicolas Necropont, who famously said, like air and drinking water, being digital will be noticed only by its absence, not its presence. He went on to write that the really surprising changes will be elsewhere in our lifestyle and how we collectively manage ourselves on this planet. Some have started referring to this as the post-digital. Dave White summarized this as follows. Now that the digital technology and the network are so prevalent, our thinking should go beyond the technology in and of itself and focus on the ways our introductions are played out in on the digital. So, are we in the post-digital era and what does this mean? Before I begin my talk in earnest, I would like to acknowledge that Railroads University and the neighborhood where I live are in the traditional lands of the Kwasapsum and the Lekwungen ancestors and families who have lived here for thousands of years. Indigenous communities have long lived on these lands and I'm grateful to be able to live and work here. To acknowledge these lands is to acknowledge the need for conciliation and the harms that colonization has had on indigenous people here and around the world. Much of the conversation in higher education at this particular point in time focuses on building back better versus returning to an imagined normal that existed before the pandemic. To engage in such rebuilding means to recognize that various pre-pandemic teaching, learning and institutional practices were problematic. Building back better invites us to engage in practices that are cooperative and inclusionary. Territorial acknowledgements, therefore, should remind us that colonial structures impact our universities and our teaching and learning practices. Let's start by taking stock of our broader environment. Online and blended learning has a long history and has been a practice considered by the majority of Canadian institutions prior to the pandemic and very many global institutions before the pandemic. In 2019, nearly 75% of Canadian universities and colleges reported having or developing an online learning strategy and about 20% of them were applying it. In the US, the latest data that we have 
show that between 2000 and 2017, the number of students that were taking at least an online course uh, more than quadrupled. Approximately 33% of students take at least one online course prior to the pandemic. And now during the pandemic, nearly all students over the last um, 18 months have at least taken one uh, online course. Of course, these numbers vastly underestimate the number of people who participate in online forms of learning. Once you consider non-credit offerings such as MOOCs or online training or a slew of other online learning actions and activities that people undertake on a daily basis, then you begin realizing that online learning is normal, not just an exception. Most people have participated in some form of online learning or another. Now let's talk a little bit about the students. Over the last month, we identified about 20 surveys of students in Canadian institutions. There are about 200 higher education institutions, public higher education institutions in Canada. Our population is around 37 million. These 20 surveys um, were completed by individual institutions over the last 18 months. And by analyzing it, my colleagues and I are finding that student concerns with remote teaching and learning predominantly focus on four areas mental health and well-being, financial concerns, quality of the educational experience during remote teaching and learning, and the impact of the pandemic on students' future plans for education and work. Some of these are broad, but they bear direct relevance to the courses that you and I might teach. Part of my work focuses on the idea that we need to understand students as people and not just students. We need to see students as individuals who have agency, desires, mishaps, dreams, life-changing experiences, and as individuals who face the daily minutiae of life like the rest of us, and experience frustrations, excitement, disappointment, and living life just like the rest of us. For example, many students in these surveys indicate that they have experienced a decline in mental health. A national survey reported that around 60% of students were worried about the pandemic. One college survey reported that a large number of students were struggling with isolation and loneliness. And nearly 40% of students at a large public university reported symptoms of psychological distress. What is also important about these surveys is the recommendations that students put forward. The recommendations include financial relief for students, greater flexibility, more academic accommodations, improved mental health support. Importantly, technology and the ways that technology is used are not showing up in these surveys as important areas of concern. So, are we at a post-digital place? Are we at a place where technology doesn't necessarily matter, where it's invisible? Let's turn to post-pandemic environments. Let's turn to flexibility in the context of post-pandemic futures and discuss how flexibility can be a powerful mechanism for access, equity, and success. Flexibility can center on individual and institutional responses. It can be mobilized as a result of a technology, such as, for example, through a piece of software that allows us to meet even though we're in different physical locations, like this one, or through teaching practices that we use that make teaching and learning more flexible, such as, for example, providing multiple assessment options for students, regardless of the kind of technology that we use. Typically, practitioners and researchers have been optimistic about digital learning, expecting it to broaden access to education, reduce the costs of education, support new pedagogical models, and enable flexibility. By digital, here, I mean any form of teaching and learning that includes use of technology. It may mean online learning, or it may mean integrating technology in a face-to-face -face setting. It might mean hybrid, it might mean blended. What I would like to do here is focus on that last bit, that digital learning enables flexibility. Optimism for flexibility is reflected in the ongoing claim in the literature that online and blended learning provide people with the possibility of learning anytime 
from anywhere. Flexibility is mobilized as a rhetorical device to mean more of something, more accommodating, more flexible, more equitable than the alternative. Oftentimes this is true. In-person instruction can often be inequitable and inflexible. We often fail to recognize the fact that in-person education has significant shortcomings. For example, it often takes place at particular points in time and in particular places. It forces people to uproot their lives to come to our institutions, or to drive for an hour or two after work to get here. Or worse, it excludes those who cannot uproot their lives to come to our universities. It's worse because those who cannot leave their home to come to us. Maybe people who are traditionally excluded. People who we should be doing a better job at serving. People like those who are caring for their family, their children, or their parents. With this lens, in-person education is not the most equitable option we have available to us. It's the one that we're accustomed to. It's the default. It's the status quo, and it's problematic. This, however, isn't to say that all education should be online, or that all education should be blended, or that one approach isn't always better than the other. There's no single solution to the problems facing education. In the same way that online learning isn't the solution, in-person education is not a silver bullet solution to the problems that we're facing. I want us to pause here for a little bit because I find that conversations around modalities like online, in-person, blended learning often become abstract. What I'd like to ask you to do is to imagine students. Imagine your students, or imagine the students that your colleagues or friends have in their classes. Think about their day and their responsibilities. I'll pause for 10 seconds to give you a moment to think about them. Okay, ready? If we had time for an extended conversation, I would have asked whether they're full-time or part-time students, where they work, whether they work, whether they have children or family that they take care of, whether they have health concerns, whether they're facing housing unaffordability or food insecurity, whether they live alone or with others, whether they have private rooms to study or what they hope to get out of their education. But when you imagine these students, do these students really study anywhere at any time? When and where do they study? I'm asking these questions essentially to say that the idea that people study anytime and anywhere is an oversimplification. Students study at particular places in particular times. They study in times where they're able to. They basically need to fit their studies into times for which there are competing claims. Perhaps after they put kids to bed, after they cook a meal for the family, and so on. All of our time relies on competing priorities. We rely on making the most of our time to um, to satisfy all the responsibilities that we have in our lives. Students do the same. So when we think of the post-pandemic, or whatever reality or normal comes after we're through with the pandemic, or even now, we don't, even, we don't need to think post-pandemic. We, think about, we need to think about the now. We need to recognize that there are different solutions to different problems. And that one of the challenges that we have is that we have imagined universities and places of teaching and learning as being at the center of students' lives. Instead, what I invite you to do is to consider lives being at the center of students' lives and universities and learning environments surrounding them. What this invites us to do is to imagine different kinds of teaching and learning environments that cater to the needs and the lives of students. In other words, what this might allow us to do is to offer in-person learning, online learning, digital learning, 
asynchronous learning, cohort-based approaches to education to different kinds of people based on their different needs. Instead of imagining education as being a one-size-fits-all approach, there are spaces to think of education and to think of different institutions serving different kinds of people for different kinds of needs, for different kinds of topics, for different kinds of learning experiences. I should end there. I've taken you on a tour of some of the more important issues that I see around blended and flexible learning at this particular moment in time. And I want to end with a prompt. Right now, my colleagues and I are working on a project that is informed by faculty perspectives about the future of higher education. This is one of the prompts I've given faculty colleagues. I think it's a question worth reflecting upon. Thank you again for having me and for making time to be with us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Valetzianos. And indeed, it is a question to ponder on. What are our hopes, aspirations, fears, and anxieties surrounding the education of the future? I promise we'll get back to that, but I want to hear with you, Andrew. Um, what do you immediately think of when he asks the question? Um, well, I think the, the question that he was trying to answer around the digital revolution um, I'm not sure that it's over, but I think maybe using the word revolution is, is uh, it, it kind of divides people. And so actually, as Dean kind of talked about yesterday, you know, education is constantly changing. And I think technology will continue to drive some of those changes, uh, whether we like it or not, as we've seen. Um, so I think, you know, having an informed view on where we would like learning to go in the future as educators is also really important so that the technology doesn't drive education in a way that we, did, we don't want it to as be, educators. Be in the forefront or yeah. running after. Yeah, well, I think informed is, is kind of the best way to be because then you know kind of all the other factors that are actually having a, a kind of, um, yeah, kind of playing on education. And like you say, being at the forefront enables you to make informed choices. So we're wrapping up these two days of NoHo EdTech. What's your biggest takeaway? Uh, I think I'm really optimistic. I mean, we've seen lots of people that are very, very engaged from students to professors to teachers. So I'm very optimistic for the future of education. But I think at the same time, as we've talked about, we need to be mindful of the role that technology is playing and also remember that it's a tool and it's not a solution in itself. You know, we have to engage with it as educators and work out the best way to use it to help students to learn. Thank you, Andrew. So we've come to the end of two packed days of NoHo EdTech, and we promised you, you would be wiser. We're pretty sure you must have learned something new about EdTech that you didn't know before. And if you do want more, uh, have a look at also our special sessions that's made available for you on the NoHo EdTech website. There you'll find two sessions that you may access at any time. One is Project Play at Heart, a recent initiative by Denmark's university colleges together with the LEGO Foundation and a part of the Playful Learning Programme. Play at Heart uh, focuses on children's play and construction with technology in order to perform in a digitalized world. And the second session is by the ICT resource group for the schools in Stavanger here in Norway. And they believe ICT should be used to strongly modify or redefine teaching and will provide you with examples of how to do it. Recordings of uh, the two-day session, Know How EdTech, will be available on our website and, and YouTube. And you can share them with anyone. And thanks again to Andrew, expert and uh, our team who put the program together, and not the least our supporters that made Know How EdTech possible. Thanks so much for being with us, and we hope we'll see you again on our future Know How EdTech events. So that's all from here. Thank you so much. Take care.